I want to thank everybody for coming out on Sunday, the week before finals. <laughs> I know that that's tough to do. Um, so, my name is Ian Morrison. I'm the president of the Platypus Affiliated Society. I graduated from the school um, with a master's in art history. And Platypus uh, is an organization that puts together reading groups here on the campus at SCIC and also up north at Loyola um, about the history of the left. Um, and we, we do a year syllabus about the new and the old left. And we write journalism reflecting on the history of the left in the 19th and 20th century. Um, and we publish work in the Platypus Review that you might have seen on campus. It's free. It's distributed across the city. And it's um, open for submission to anybody who's interested. Um, I want to apologize that we're missing two speakers, Gulzar Ahmad and Yasser Ahmad, are, uh, weren't able to be here because of problems with uh, their visas. Um, but we are very pleased to have Rabina Jamal with us today. Um, she's here because of the U.S. Labor Against the War Conference that happened this weekend. If you don't know about this organization, it's uh, a confederation of trade unions who oppose the war, and they've been trying to reach out to trade unionists in Iraq and in Pakistan and other parts of the world um, to reformulate uh, some kind of program to deal with the ongoing war. Um, we're here um, the week that Obama has announced a possible, or a not so possible, troop surge um, in Pakistan to discuss really the still vexing problem of anti-imperialist politics on the left today and the difficulty in reformulating some form of coherent internationalism. Um, Rubin Jamal um, is here from the All-Pakistani Trade Union Federation and also the Working Women's Organization uh, in Lahore, Pakistan. And she's going to speak about that today. We also have Atia Khan, who's a, a PhD student here at the school, um, who's working on a thesis that deals with the history of the left in Pakistan. Um, to my far right is Spencer Lenner. He's a professor at the college and also studies South Asia. He'll be moderating the panel. I want to turn it over to him. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Is, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm going to keep my introductory remarks very brief. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, the question of imperialism, of American imperialism, and of the limits of, of anti-imperialist politics uh, are posed nowhere more acutely uh, than with reference to the region of Pakistan and Afghanistan today. Uh, this is not only because um, the avowed enemy of American troops in in the region are um, a, a very uh, despicable brand of, of, of right-wing uh, Islamist uh, jihadis known as the Taliban, uh, but on the other side because uh, there's really no country uh, in the world uh, that better exemplifies uh, the perniciousness of the effects of American imperialism uh, over the last half century uh, than does Pakistan. And it's really uh, that, that that we have to understand to, to grasp at least something of the genesis of the Taliban and, and, and of the current political situation there. Uh, so ever, ever, ever since the um, the signing uh, by General Ayub Khan of the 1954 Mutual Defense Assistance Agreement between the United States and Pakistan, America has supported militarism against democracy and has been uh, arming the the primary, uh, the most immediate enemies of the um, of the working class in that region. Uh, this is um, th this is a history that uh, isn't wholly obviated uh, by the fact that. The uh, Taliban is is currently uh, on the other end of American gun sites. So, just to uh, bring out some very, very briefly uh, some of this history that I'm sure that that both Rubina and, and Atia will will also address. Um, 
America supported the generals, uh, the Pakistani generals that, that they trained against the demand uh, for elections in the late 1960s. They supported them in their refusal to acknowledge the results of those elections after they were held. And in the uh, brutal Bangladesh war that ensued, uh, the consequences of which uh, continue to reverberate uh, through uh, South Asian politics. And finally, uh, or, 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 or in, just to, to sort of bring out the highlights, uh, the U.S. did not object to the arrest and the judicial murder of Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto uh, by the Pakistani military dictator Zia ul Haq in the late 70s. And after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, U.S. support for Zia was consummated in uh, around a project of of the Islamization of of both Pakistan in and Afghanistan uh, through the support of the Mujahideen, and it should be remembered the uh, implementation of Sharia law in Pakistan itself. So, it's against this background. Um, that the the poignancy of of our current moment, uh, which is you know strongly marked by a kind of political helplessness on the left, uh, really has to be seen. Where now, post two thousand one, post nine eleven, uh, the United States has. Um, necessarily to the extent that uh, at least to the extent that they represent a, a threat to the to the functioning of, of the global economic system targeted uh, radical Islamism uh, in this region and then to a large extent um, you know the the poignancy of it is 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 amplified by the fact that the left uh, largely echoes an, a, 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 an American ruling class distinction uh, between the good Taliban and the bad Taliban, i.e. the Taliban that represent a, a threat to the functioning of the world economic system and those that only represent a threat uh, to the Pakistani and Afghan working classes uh, regarding which we don't have to be concerned uh, is at the, at the heart of the distinction, for instance, uh, invoked in, in President Obama's recent speech and and so it's it, it's it's really against that background that um, that that we have organized this forum uh, to address the questions of solidarity and anti-imperialist politics uh, in the present and and with that uh, I will turn it over to Rabina and then after that uh, we'll hear from Atya and they'll have a chance to respond to one another uh, at maybe once or, or a couple of times and then we'll open it up for questions. So, Rubina. Uh, thank you so much. I'm uh, really very happy to be here with you and uh, sharing about uh, the situation in, uh, in Pakistan which is really very uh, miserable. Um, I would like to uh, tell you that uh, my country, Pakistan, got independ independence in 63 years ago, in which 31 years remain under the dictatorship period. During the period, its in inception, the miseries of the uh, uh, workers uh, uh, peoples became increased, such as unemployment, price hike, rising debts are the hallmark of the government. Still, the present government, uh, who is claiming that they are the democratic but continued they are following the same pol policies as the previous dictators. Uh, Pakistan suffered a great socio-economic and political uh, crisis. Afghanistan was starred by the U.S. imperialism, uh, imperialists not only damaging the Afghanistan economy, also disturb, uh, disturbing the innocent peoples and uh, killing the hundred thousands of men and women and children. But this war also, the Afghanistan war also spread all over in Pakistan, which uh, destroy uh, and, and destroy our economy and law and order situation is going worse day by day. And uh, the American break up the Pakistan for their own uh, political interest. Due to this, the Pakistan army is also fighting in, uh, because of the war, the Pakistan army is fighting in true provinces. Uh, 
the army operation is going on in Waziristan in South NWF area and there is a, 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 a fight between the Balochis and between the army is going on in Balochistan also which create a lot of problem and thousands and thousands of uh, uh, ten, uh, more than 10 hundred thousands people uh, leave their homeland and living in a very bad situation in in camps which uh, uh, create by those people who uh, left their homeland so this battle has completely damaged and uh, uh, and uh, damage uh, create a uh, great uh, problems for the common people uh, throughout the province uh, terrorist attacks are also going on in pakistan capital city which is islamabad and the other big city in lahore in punjab uh, in the year of 2008 the, uh, the there was a suicide attack that killed more than 1200 peoples including police and army pers persons also and 3,000 more than 3,000 uh, uh, people they uh, injured still the attacks are going on uh, due to these attacks there is a great fear and uh, frustration among the people and among the masses it was very clear and it is in the mind of the US president that military official come to the uh, to the conclusion that the Afghanistan there is a Afghan war strategy have totally failed the US president will not authorize to send additional 4000 troops to Afghanistan without a formula formulation of new strategy the British chief of army wants that the US NATO mission is Afghanistan near to be failed he said that uh, it was near to be failed uh, recently the Taliban attack in Afghanistan since uh, uh, months ago uh, has intensified forcing retreat from several locations the suicide bombing in Kabul and the other major Taliban assault uh, in July 2008 and October 2009 uh, um, um, Many of uh, American army uh, caused um, uh, American ca uh, caused casualties. 70 American soldiers killed, more than 70 killed, and uh, more than 100 they uh, injured. The military dictatorship uh, uh, in the past, uh, dictator of uh, in past, General Zayal Haq used a religion in Pakistan as a tool to continue its ruthless military rule. This was the beginning of the darkest era in the history of Pakistan. This military dictatorship announced the Islamization of society and was to repress ever progressive element in the society. This regime used the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan as an opportunity to further spread radical Islamic ideology in society. This regime initiated the jihad in Afghanistan and many jihadist organizations were established and many training camps were established. This was a co-product of of, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, American CIA and Pakistan intelligence agency ISI. Western power and the oil-rich Gulf states provide billions and billions of dollars for uh, the jihadis uh, movement. Thousands of Arab fighters were brought to Pakistan. Even young people from Britain and other European countries were trained in the training, training camp, uh, camps in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Some religious also established a cells religious organization, also established their uh, branches in European countries to recruit young people and to collect financial donation. No Western government, including U.S. imperialism, objected to these activities. According to the survey, 80% people said that they opposed the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, but after the withdrawal of the Soviet forces, the Pakistani state continued to pursue the same policies and the U.S. imperialism provided much needed finances. In this situation, uh, you can imagine the war is going on in two, two provinces in Pakistan and every day there was a more than four or five suicide attacks, sometimes seven suicide attacks uh, in all over Pakistan and nobody know 
uh, during uh, there is any protest who can blast the bombs and thousands of people innocent people are killing day by day in this situation you can imagine the workers are passing a very very cricket, critical days because of the economic exploitation and the restriction on the freedom of association worse living condition and working condition of the workers formation of anti workers laws snatch the rights of the common worker and there is a great struggle which is going on in pakistan against the privatization and against the war and uh, uh, there is uh, because of the uh, electricity shutdown we have no electricity we have no dams we have no big dams and small dams so our uh, in the uh, in pakistan the electricity is uh, is shut down is the duration is 12 to 14 hours a day so you can imagine the um, the uh, management and the bosses are closing the factories because of the different region, uh, reason the one reason is shortage of electricity and the second re reason is there is a war and bad law and order situation so workers are losing their job and there is a great unrest among the working class in pakistan and recently this government which claims that they are the democratic government they uh, since year ago they uh, 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 they uh, impose a law of industrial relation act according to that that act uh, the trade union rights are restricted and rather than to uh, the bosses make an agreement with the trade union uh, to accept the workers and trade union demands they are making a, they allow to make a agreement with a single worker which is also uh, the strike is restricted uh, it's is ban if there is a trade a strong trade union they can uh, ex ex strike for the acceptance of their demand and uh, i would like to mention because if i uh, i don't know what time uh, the people of pakistan especially the working class are totally against the drones attack you know there there is a drones attack uh, uh, going on by the us military and uh, it's it's uh, go going on in the one specific area where they think that there is a al qaeda and talibans are are there but no but nobody knows whether there is al qaeda is existing or not so these drones attack creating a lot of uh, fear among the people and they want to stop the drones attack the pakistani government is resisting against these drone attack but now the obama government is already announced today i saw the television they announced that they want to increase the drones attack i think it is not a way to uh, to kill the innocent people and to maintain a peace it is not possible if you want to maintain maintain a peace in the region and in maintain a peace in a country so i it 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 is better to start a negotiations and uh, dialogues with uh, the progressive forces the pakistani government is always uh, is uh, uh, working like a puppet of uh, the uh, a us uh, government and always following the policies and anti workers and anti people policies because they are getting the huge uh, billions and billions of dollars from the IMF and from the World Bank so they are following the policies which they are which the US government is uh, 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 drafting for us to apply uh, for the pakistani peoples and the working class of pakistan uh, the big question is for maintain a peace and to end war in the country as well as in the, in the region as well as in the world because if there is no peace uh, there is the no in, uh, industry will uh, establish and the people cannot find the job and you can imagine the uh, there is a university in islamabad called named islamic university and last month there was a one uh, explosion uh, by suicide bomb uh, bomber they attacked on the university and five uh, students female student they lost their lives and they, after that there was a great terror uh, uh, among the students and the government announced to close the schools for 10 or 12 days now the schools are uh, are open and university 
universities are open but uh, i i uh, i pay the salute to my my people who are uh, even though they are in the terrible situation but they are moving forward they are raising their voices on uh, at national level as a uh, regional and international level and even though there is a uh, increasing of poverty uh, high inflation uh, uh, the basic commodity commodities are increasing day by day and uh, people and especially women are uh, suicide they kill themselves because of they are not uh, 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 providing a food to the family to the kids so they uh, the peoples are dying day by day by the attack uh, by the army and by the suicide bombers as well as uh, because of the poverty so the situation is really very difficult and uh, why i am here because i i i want to uh, it is my first time to be in a usa and i i want to know i want to know about uh, uh, the people who are living in usa the way which they are working uh, the strategy which they are using in at workplace the working class struggle as well as the struggle against uh, the war uh, against iraq and afghanistan now it's a spread in pakistan also so i want to maintain develop a working a relationship a friendship and a solidarity between the working class between the youth and between the common people of usa and and pakistan and uh, now i would like to give a mic to uh, atia mm -hmm. and then if uh, i have something to add but uh, i think it's i take up my time good good thank you uh, thanks Okay, um, the remnants of the international left are faced with an unsatisfying Faustian compromise between the U.S. invasion and occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq and the conservative insurgencies that oppose the U.S. in Afghanistan and Iraq that find succor in Pakistan. <laughs> the absence of an international left aligned with labor organizations means that the issue of U.S. imperialism will continue to obscure the important differences between the situation in Afghanistan Afghanistan and Pakistan on the one hand and Iraq on the other. I would therefore like to thank the organizers for organizing this event which offers everyone at the table a chance to think through these difficulties and I submit the following by way of preliminary remarks and a first step at articulating what I think is salient about the wars that also encompass Pakistan in rather important ways. An unintended consequence of the US occupation in Iraq is the remobilization of trade unionism. There should be no illusions on this score. Unions that suffered under the Ba'athist regime would be impossible to organize if Al-Qaeda or the Shia Imams who advocate attacks on unions were to rule over Babylon. The crimes that the Ba'athists committed in the name of Arab socialism are undeniable. The once vibrant CP of Iraq was slaughtered with the sanction of the Soviet Union after the Ba'athists wrested control of the state. Yet, there was industrial development that Saddam Hussein had initiated in the 1970s, although much of this was undone in the course of the 1980s through the war of attrition with the Khomeiniite Islamic Republic of Iran, then under the weight of international sanctions throughout the 1990s. The course of development in Pakistan from the mid-1950s offers a much different tale. If I might be allowed to state the, the if I might be allowed to state the matter somewhat polemically, the consolidation of a regressive agrarian economy in Pakistan cast a rather different shadow on the left labor coalitions that forced the military dictator General Ayub Khan to abdicate in 1968. In other words, while the left in Iraq had the experience of the Stalinization of the left via trade unionism, the retreat of the left into Stalinism came to an underdeveloped Pakistan in its Chinese manifestation through a mobilization of the peasantry, particularly in what was once called East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. The left in Pakistan, I shall attempt to argue, effectively turned into the right in the course of the 1960s and 70s. Let me therefore offer a brief sketch of this salient moment in the history of the Pakistani left. 
The left-led alliance of labor and the peasantry forced the hand of the state in Pakistan in 1968 and 69. The anti-labor statutes, as well as the attempt at privatizing industry enacted under General Ayub Khan, restricted unionization while depressing wages. The, this led to a wave of union strikes in Karachi, Lahore, and other industrial centers that drew in railway workers, doctors, and hospital employees, farmers, waterworks, and electrical workers. General Ayub failed in negotiations with union leaders. He was also by then the object of the increasingly vociferous demands of the student movement. He thus stepped aside, appointing another Pakistani army general, Yahya Khan, as interim head of state to reach an agreement with labor leaders. It was in this context that a new party, the People's Party of Pakistan, emerged in West Pakistan in 1967, while an old one, the Awami League, was able to revitalize itself in East Pakistan. Both these organizations were strengthened by the incorporation of a vast number of leftists who were either disillusioned by the National Awami Party, a broad umbrella coalition formed after the CPP was outlawed in 1957, or inspired by the quasi-populist rhetoric of the PPP under Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. These leftists brought with them trained cadres in addition to an attractive ideological program to win over the allegiance of the masses. The PPP, therefore, was formed as a menagerie of leftist cadres from the National Awami Party, ex-members of the Muslim League, students, and the landlords of Sindh and Punjab. Bhutto was able to exploit the radical stratum of the party in the run-up to elections. The rhetoric of socialism combined with the slogans capturing anti-imperial, anti-feudal sentiments embraced the zeitgeist of the 1960s New Left. However, once the PPP wrested control of the state, its left flank was faced with the choice of either accepting the commands of the state or to self-liquidate. When the outcome of the 1970 election resulted in an overall majority for the Bengali nationalists in East Pakistan, which entitled the Awami League to form the government, Bhutto was unable to reconcile himself to, to a junior partnership in a coalition at the center. With the support of the United States, which was eager to offset Soviet influence in South Asia, as well as India, which under Indira Gandhi feared the radicalization of the East Pakistanis spilling across the Ganges, Bhutto sent in the army, precipitating the Bangladesh war. Had it laid any real foundations in the era preceding the upheaval, the left might have transformed the situation to its favor. But in 1972, Bhutto's nationalization policy brought the confrontation with the labor movement to a head. Some 200,000 workers called a strike in Karachi that brought the city to a standstill. The left was locked in a state of paralysis. The left faction within the PPP feared that if the strikes continued, this would jeopardize the possibility of long-term benefits. The Maoist left was reluctant to support further strikes, since the labor movement excluded the peasantry from its struggle. For much of the 70s, especially after the, after the worldwide economic collapse of 1972 and 73 that reached Pakistan on the heels of the Bangladesh war, Bhutto tried to solve the beleaguered state apparatus, including the military, but was unable to stem the exodus of workers and the middle class. The decimation of the left and of labor had culminated on the international level in the neoliberal Thatcher regime, Thatcher Reagan regimes that in turn strengthened conservative forces within Pakistan just as the Soviets marched on Afghanistan. General Ziaul Haq, who had overthrown Bhutto in 1977, tendered Pakistan as an Islamic bulwark in the proxy war. Thus, with Zia at the helm of the state in Pakistan, the victory of Khomeini's Islamic revolution in Iran in 1979, and the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, the character of democracy in Pakistan was left to be validated by either the military establishment or by religious clerics. 
The brief interludes of civilian rule in Pakistan since then, which include the election of Benazir Bhutto in 1988 and then later in 1993 and by Nawaz Sharif's election in 1990 and subsequently in 1997 amounted to little more than neoliberal cronyism in the absence of the left. The real issue that any left labor coalition needs to confront in Pakistan is this complicity that contributed to the death of the left in the 1970s, bolstered by the ideologies of conservative nationalism and culturalism. If union leaders are to do more than to applaud restoration of attenuated liberal rights under the PPP or Nawaz Sharif, this history will require close re-examination. For it is clear that such democratic regimes were the ones responsible for completing the agenda set by the Taliban in Afghanistan to find an ally across the Khyber Pass in the 1970s. As I note in my recent article in the Platypus Review, it was Benazir Bhutto who, during her first premiership in 1988, was expressly complicit in nurturing the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Paradoxically, she, she was herself to become a victim of the project of Islamization initiated by Ziaul Haq that she sought to fuel. The situation is indeed rather different from the region dubbed Afpak than it is in Iraq. For the Taliban, as is well known, first sprung to life from a witch's brew of Chinese opportunism, the panic that gripped Washington after the fall of the Shah, oil sheikh philanthropy, and the reactionary political imperatives that have guided the Pakistani military since the country's inception. Simply put, the communist coup in Afghanistan in 1978 drove the neoliberal regimes in the Muslim world and the United States to distraction. Support by CIA and Saudi money, but orchestrated by Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, the ISI, the worst of the reactionary Afghan landlords, together with whichever of their more religion and patriarchy warped peasants, whose allegiance they could command, were armed and indoctrinated with a caustic brand of fascistic Islam. At the same time, entire regions of Afghanistan and Pakistan shifted over to a war economy driven by opium, guns, and mercenary payments. Generations of young men dislocated in Afghan refugees, refugee camps were absorbed into madrasas closely aligned to one or another of Pakistan Islamist parties and sponsored by Islamist money flowing out of the Gulf. Far from amorphous, the Pakistani Taliban is linked ideologically and organizationally to the same elements that the ISI fostered in Afghanistan in the 1980s and 1990s and is now deeply enmeshed with Al-Qaeda. How the international left orients its stance on U.S. imperialism vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan is thus even more pressing but also potentially more opaque. The withdrawal of the U.S., as the latest headlines make clear, would effectively mean the Pakistani army will again acquiesce to the Taliban, as was the case in Sawat and Waziristan. In the absence of an international left aligned with labor organizations, Iraqi unions will continue to flounder. In the absence of an international left aligned with labor organizations, there is no alternative for Afghanistan or Pakistan but to remain failed states. In the absence of an international left aligned with labor organizations, the bet noir of U.S. imperialism will continue to obfuscate more than it unveils. Thanks. Uh, thank you both, Rabina and Atya. Uh, Rabina, if you would like to yeah. either respond to what Atya yeah. said or to elaborate your own I, comments I further. To, I want to add something about uh, the situation of uh, women in, in Pakistan. As as you know that uh, the Pakistan is an Islamic uh, uh, country and uh, where the women are uh, facing a lot of problems during the Ziaul Haq period. The Ziaul Haq uh, dicta one dictator, he formulated uh, uh, form 
formulate a laws so called sharia laws which is which imposed which is, uh, still are in uh, practicing in in pakistan and because of that laws the women are behind the bar and they are in the several hundreds of women are in the jail because of the hudood ordinance and because of the blasphemy laws the innocent peoples are in the jail and the women who are uh, 65% women are working in uh, in in a garment sector where they work uh, uh, 12 to 14 hours without getting any overtime the in car carpet weaving sector uh, 55 more than 55% women are working there and more 90% women are working as a home based worker so for home based worker the women who are working as a piece trade and home based worker they are denying all the basic rights because we have no legislation for these uh, workers who are working uh, in home based industry and for agriculture sector uh, 62% women are working in agriculture se sector since uh, till morning to evening uh, at 6 o'clock uh, in the morning and 6 o'clock uh, in the evening and they are getting no salary uh, as you know that there is a patriarchal and feudalistic system is in pakistan which really suppress the poor people and the women uh, condition is more vulnerable uh, co compared to uh, male workers uh, it it is really uh, very sad that uh, every field of life women are working in in pakistan but according to government uh, statistics uh, very less women are working uh, there is a, 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 a trade union movement is uh, having a, uh, still they are having a patriarchal ideology and they are not seriously concerned about uh, to improve the uh, the women membership and women as a leader of the trade union uh, i want to say that uh, i was working in a multinational american multinational pharmaceutical company and i spent 10 years as a worker in my uh, in my company uh, where i was working but uh, because i spent 10 years because we raised the voice uh, uh, against uh, the military dictator and uh, we struggle a lot for the moment of uh, restoration of democracy and uh, to uh, for workers and especially for women workers right uh, they uh, thrown us uh, from the job uh, in during 1980 85 so so um uh at that time i found that uh, why the women uh, workers are not uh, uh, raising their voice because they don't know about uh, uh, what the labor law says how uh, it is important to organize their uh, their organization and uh, 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 why it is so important to mobilize these women workers then uh, during that time we formed a working women organization and it was a one organization at that time who raised a women workers issue uh, related with uh, maternity leave and related with minimum wage and related with uh, if they face any sexual harassment at workplace which is really very common in pakistan uh, they can contact us and we help a lot to uh, to aware these women uh, how to form a union and uh, uh, to build a leadership capacity among women and workers to be a leader of their union so um, and we are also organizing and we are successful to change the mindset of uh, all pakistan trade union federation uh, few uh, uh, workers uh, few, uh, leadership of all pakistan trade union uh, federation uh, through organize a gender sensitization program that women rights are human rights and uh, women are uh, uh, have a right uh, uh, to struggle to stop gender discrimination in our society and everybody know that there is uh, no taliban government in in uh, uh, operating in in afghanistan but still i would like to say something about that uh, about the afghani movement because it is really very important to know what uh, how much suppressed they are um, still there is a so called democratic government and karzai is a pro american uh, president is uh, is uh, 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 ruling the government in Afghanistan every 30 minutes an afghan woman dies during childbirth 87% afghan women are illiterate 
30% girls have access to education in Afghanistan. One in every three Afghan women experience physical or psychological or sexual violence. Uh, 44 years is average life of expectancy rate for Afghani women. 70 to 80% of women faced forced marriages in Afghanistan and 80% of Afghani women are affected by domestic violence. Over 60% of marriages are forced and half of all girls are married before the age of 16. Seven years after the US and UK uh, led uh, Afghan women from there is a, a U.S. forces, U.S.-led forces in Afghanistan, but Afghani women are facing a high degree of oppression uh, during the Taliban regime, and still the women life is just as a bad for for the previous. The gender violence is increasing. Uh, maternal mortality ranking is uh, 1,600 to 1,900 out of every 100,000 women dying in child during childbirth why i am not discussing about pakistan yes in pakistan i'm uh, i'm i feel shameful that the birth rate is same like afghanistan uh, mortality rate is same like afghanistan and the education rate is is more than uh, maybe afghanistan but we are trying hard to pressurize our government to make uh, to uh, to formulate a policy which is pro people which is pro women which is pro uh, uh, children so um, the struggle is going on inside the pakistan uh, because of the suicide attacks and uh, uh, i am not uh, claiming that uh, all over pakistan the workers movement is going on but still the trade unions are existing there still they are protesting against the bad law and order situation for rising the wages and uh, uh, more jobs and uh, they want uh, increase, uh, they want uh, labor policy there, good labor policy there and uh, my trade union federation, I am a chairperson of all Pakistan trade union federation. Since two years ago, we launched an appeal uh, which is uh, uh, for peace in, in, in Pakistan and uh, as well as in the region. And uh, nas nationwide, we launched this appeal and internationally also. And we got a great response by the U.S. Uh, trade union and U.S. Uh, trade union movement and uh, the movement against against the war and throughout the country, uh, throughout the world. And uh, we organized a, 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 a trade union federation congress in year 2008 against uh, the war and building a peace. Why the workers want peace? Because if there is no peace, the industry cannot develop and flourish and peoples cannot find the job if the life are threatened. And because we, uh, the, uh, we uh, on behalf of my organization, our leadership is always criticizing the policies which the ruling government is adopting. We uh, face a lot, uh, we are receiving a lot of threats by the extremist forces, uh, by the bosses as well as by the, the, the rulers. But still, uh, even though there is a situation, is difficult, but uh, we have a dream that the one day, because of the struggle of the majority of the Pakistani people, because of the struggle of the majority of the Pakistani women and the children, we will definitely uh, able to build uh, a peace in, in, in Pakistan as well as in Afghanistan. But without the help of our international friends, without the help of your solidarity, uh, which, which is really uh, needable, I I think uh, we will not win this uh, fight, which is really very, uh, very difficult. And I say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on the, in front of you. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, do you want to uh, say a few words? Yeah, I actually um, have a couple of 
questions and comments. And since you talked about quite a few things in your presentation, and it seems that, uh, the, that the most pressing issue for Pakistanis and also those uh, existing outside of Pakistan is the, uh, the current war that is going on in Afghanistan and ways in which it affects Pakistan. And there, uh, there have been a lot of criticisms about uh, American, about the American involvement in, uh, in Pakistan, sort of fighting this proxy war uh, with drone attacks, and there have been very severe criticisms of, of, about that, around that issue. And, uh, and I think that this, this is indeed a very tricky situation. It's a very complicated situation. And the American involvement actually also plays a very, uh, in a sense, it plays a very definite role. It plays a very important role. And uh, we have seen that recently in Pakistan, uh, the Taliban has been emboldened to attack, uh, like suicide bomb attacks, in the major cities of Pakistan, as well as their uh, takeover of the Valley of Salat, where the conditions of women, uh, men, children, uh, girls, young girls, is actually pretty dismal. It's pretty horrific. And uh, so I actually would like to know know your opinions and also ways in which your organization, and by that I mean the All Pakistan Trade Union Federation, uh, how do they orient their politics uh, around this issue of American involvement? Because it seems to me that there will be real consequences if American forces withdraw today, that there is going to be some kind of a bloodbath. There, it, the situation probably would turn more, would, would become more adverse for women in Pakistan. Uh, we have already seen that actually during um, Zia ul Haq's regime, the kind of gains that the women's movements um, achieved and also the labor movement achieved in the period of the late 60s and early 70s. All of those have been undone. And so I wonder how your organization and yourself uh, orient, you know, around these issues, orient your politics. I mean, and also, I think I would like to also bring in that con context, I am curious, to you know, if the Pakistani trade unionists have any links with um, Indian, with the Indian trade unionists, with uh, Bangladeshi trade unionists, uh, Sri Lankan, like sort of regionally, how, where is all Pakistan trade union federation situated? Mm -hmm. Uh, in relation to the situation of women uh, in Pakistan, yes, you are right that it is miserable and especially in the Sabat Valley where the Sharia laws are already imposed. Uh, uh, we are struggling since the uh, 80s uh, against the Sharia laws, 1982, uh, Ziaul Haq formulated uh, Sharia laws against, which we call black laws against women. And uh, uh, my organization, with the help of other women organization, we struggle a lot in Pakistan. We organize a different protest against the laws uh, to abolish these discriminatory laws, as well as to formulate uh, policies against a viol uh, to make a law, formulate a law to stop violence against women and uh, to stop sexual harassment. And it was a long struggle. And we will uh, we get some uh, we uh, we got some achievement also because uh, 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 like uh, a, a death sentence for women is a na uh, women is a symbol of honor in my in my country uh, and my the family thinks that if women can do uh, she do did a mistake and she uh, do something it's uh, it seems that it's a uh, she break the honor of the family. So for that for that uh, reason, they sometimes they killed uh, uh, several.
several girls they lost their lives because the family they killed uh, killed her and they uh, finished uh, her life so uh, we struggle a lot on we organized a big big rally in in Islamabad in front of the parliament house with the help of uh, other civil society organizations and trade unions and we will succeed it at least we get a little success to uh, to uh, convince the government and government passed uh, a law that if any person uh, do this act uh, to kill any uh, girl uh, honor killing uh, to, to, to find to indulge in a honor killing he got a punishment of life sentence and uh, uh, we are i think i'm not very uh, hopeless uh, person we are doing our best to mobilize and to aware women workers to uh, to uh, to come out on the mainstream struggle of uh, 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 regarding their rights human rights as well as to maintain peace in 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 my country we have uh, close links with the uh, some uh, trade union federation in india as well as uh, a women organization in india and uh, uh, in in uh, on at national level we formed a uh, alliance against sexual harassment against women we called uh, its name asha asha mean its hope uh, 11 uh, women uh, uh, organization who are working uh, on the issue of uh, violence against women and sexual harassment they formed this alliance and this year we uh, it this alliance was formed in year 2004 and this year we uh, are uh, get uh, the success uh, succeeded to uh, our government uh, uh, formulate a law against sexual harassment and according to that law if any uh, person uh, sexually harass a, a woman and a girl who got uh, 300000 rupees Uh, to pay the fine as well as uh, one year uh, in imprisonment i think if i am not wrong uh, so i think we are gradually moving forward and we uh, are able to uh, organize a different campaign like uh, a campaign uh, against long working hours uh, uh, at that campaign we uh, mobilize women uh, organize a protest press conferences all over in seven district of punjab and in all over pakistan and we uh, write uh, wrote a letter to uh, the authorities the labor departments as well as prime minister and uh, president of pakistan to stop uh, the long uh, to stop this uh, uh, inhuman act because it's increase if there is the struggle which started in chicago to reduce the working hours from 48 hours to 8 but the pakistani government he, he, they uh, they passed the bill and they imposed that uh, 14 uh, 12 to 14 hours so because of the struggle of the trade unions and women organization working women organization now uh, uh, there is no long working hour but still some factories the the women are working uh, uh, 12 hours but if we are uh, mentioning the name uh, giving the name to the labor department because the labor inspection is a stop under the uh, uh, industrial relation act the labor inspector is not allowed to go to visit any factory so it is really very difficult for us but we are doing our best in relation to maintain uh, a, 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 to build a strong solidarity we have good links in K, in in the philippine in sri lanka and in india as well as in nepal uh, they are inviting because in my country because of the bad law and order situation it is really difficult to invite those trade union people to come and to have a exchange uh, meeting with with uh, with the workers and with women workers but we got the opportunity to send our the delegation to different countries to uh, to exchange their views and in this critical situation uh, they are also facing uh, some problems so what strategy they are using so i think we are moving forward but uh, still there is a need to uh, 
to uh, to move uh, to do some efforts uh, and uh, in, in in my federation and in my organization we are discussing about because unfortunately there is a no left political party who claim that who have a say in masses in Pakistan uh, there is a left different small small left groups in in Pakistan they are doing a very good uh, paperwork on at computer they have a beautiful websites there but practically they are doing nothing they are doing nothing so uh, we are thinking about uh, because uh, to form a political foundation a left political oriented foundation in Pakistan and maybe in future we will able to uh, to form this and uh, the success we we got in in our struggle uh, uh, my organization is not uh, struggling uh, alone because we build an alliance on national level we are working under the umbrella of pakistan workers confederation consisting on seven big trade union federation and we believe that the joint struggle is definitely uh, result a good some achievements if uh, we struggle alone then it, in this uh, situation we will not get any any successes so that's why we are exchanging our material through computer our activities with uh, sending different uh, trade unions and women organization all over the country as well as all uh, around the world uh, and we celebrate uh, we organize a 16 days campaign against gender violence in in Pakistan which started from 25th November and it's end on uh, uh, 10th December and uh, maybe on uh, 10th uh, December the, there is a protest in, in Pakistan all uh, groups who work on violence against women they uh, they organize some rally or some uh, big one big seminar or uh, different seminars in different uh, province of Pakistan and I am agree with Atiya that there is a great uh, there is a great work more need to to go to the Swat Valley and uh, Waziristan and right now there is no political person is going to Waziristan and Swat Valley in Pakistan. The people every day do, who are speaking uh, in front of parliament and uh, in the parliament uh, and, uh, uh, in, and saying that they, they are doing their best. They are not in a position to go to that area where there is a war and where is, there is a no security. But I think uh, it is really very very important to uh, to to do a work for those women who are denying the the vote, the right of vote even they are unable to cast their vote because the family said that there is no need to make uh, identity cards of women so still uh, there is uh, much work need to uh, to move forward our struggle hmm. um, if I could um yeah. Ask a couple of questions myself, and then we will open it up to the floor. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, one question for each of you. Um, I'll ask them both, and then I'll let you uh, respond. Um, uh, for Atya, um, I agree with you that... Um, foreseeable the foreseeable consequences of the withdrawal of the American military are are, are really very unpalatable um, but it seems to me by the same token that um, it's hard to imagine the uh, American military is ever really contributing to an actual transformation progressively of the situation in Afghanistan uh, because of, you know, for, for a host of reasons, most obviously because of the class character of, of American government uh, support for the, the, the project of American imperialism in Pakistan and mm -hmm. Afghanistan uh, being rooted in a very, you know, obviously very, very degenerate ruling class in that region. And it's impossible for me at least to imagine that changing. For instance, the United States government supporting Zardari's uh, regime uh, in imposing this uh, Industrial mm -hmm. Relations Act. Mm -hmm. um, so how would um, 
you know, how, how do we avoid becoming, you know, it, 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 forcing an acknowledgement on the left that the United States does not uh, create all of the problems in Pakistan and Afghanistan and the United States withdrawal uh, wouldn't solve the problems in that region and certainly wouldn't uh, wouldn't weaken the Taliban. Mm -hmm. um, how do we hold that together uh, with a recognition that at present um, the internationalism of the left is no match for the internationalism of the ruling class um, and its presence in, in, in this region. Uh, and, and, and for Rabina, um, Atya was raising the issue of, uh, at one point she used the phrase, the left turning into the right, uh, with reference to the late 60s and early 70s. In, partic in particular, she used the example of the 1972 Karachi strike, uh, where the labor movement was opposed by the PPP government. Uh, and she described this as a situation within which the left was locked in a state of paralysis uh, by virtue of its having supported the PPP. Mm -hmm. Now, today, with the PPP uh, in power and um, with, with Zardari as prime minister, it seems to me that um, any illusions about the PPP as pro-labor uh, are, 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 are really very difficult to entertain. And what do we, and so how does, uh, how does the, the labor movement in Pakistan today, I mean you mentioned something about a political foundation. Um, what would it mean for Pakistani labor to actually have a, a, an organized political expression today when it, it seems uh, after, after 36, 36 years after the Karachi strike, 37 years after the Karachi strike, um, the problems are, 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 are much more poignant in turning to the PPP for leadership. So what kind of, 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 of politics can Pakistani trade unionism uh, hope to engage in in the future and, and what are the sort of what immediate prospects of that? Okay, um, yeah, I think it, it's, it is a very good question and uh, require, would require a lot of reflection and also questioning the current status of the international left as well as uh, the issue of uh, American imperialism and ways in which the left makes sense of that. Now as far as uh, the current uh, administration's policies go, I think you're absolutely right to say that uh, America it, I mean, doesn't care all that much. And I think, well, the 18, I think it would be fair. I mean, I've been thinking about this myself, and uh, one could perhaps draw an analogy between uh, the way the Bush administration treated the issue of Iraq, where they were given a timeline. Uh, the, the Bush administration said they had a timeline, and within that, they should get their act together. And I think it's a similar strategy whereby Obama is exerting the pressure on Karzai that it's only, they've got 18 months to have their act together, otherwise they will be left at the mercy of the Taliban, and American troops will be out of there. So now, what does that point to? That points to the fact that uh, I think, first of all, American policy is actually, has broken away from the Cold War paradigm. Um, and which means now that they, which means that it, it also points to the complete absence of the left, the, the, the absence of the Soviet Union, which was affecting uh, also American politics and American policies in these regions and in the world. And now America operates without the left. And uh, I would like to also refer in that regard, refer to my encounter uh, with labor organizers yesterday, the US law organization, which was founded in response to the war in Iraq. 
And what was quite astonishing to see last night was this uncritical emphasis on international solidarity. International solidarity against American imperialism. And I think that actually masks the real issue. And the real issue is really that of uh, organizing politics, which is emancipatory, which is actually thinking about the contradictions of global capitalism. And that's something which doesn't exist anymore. And it is here that the left is complicit, completely complicit in the project of American imperialism, because it abdicates its responsibility towards thinking through these difficult issues. So. In my opinion, um, there is a, it's a very critical situation, and it is because the left doesn't, you know, is not actually thinking, and it's, there is this unfortunate legacy of the 1960s, which makes us think that if we go out on the streets and demonstrate and protest, that is going to do something, when we know that we didn't achieve, we didn't achieve anything really. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, uh, I think that uh, there was uh, no left uh, uh, movement uh, uh, in in Pakistan uh, during the 60s. But um, uh, I heard and I I, I learned through the paper that uh, there was some intellectuals uh, have a link with the, with uh, with uh, the trade unions movement. And uh, because of that period was uh, it, 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 during 1970, there was a Zulfikar Ali Bhutto period, and People's Party was not. A, uh, I never uh, said, uh, never think that People's Party is a socialist or uh, believe on socialism. It's uh, the leader is a feudal a feudal lord. So how can it? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, sound as that it it was a socialist party uh, at that time because uh, of uh, there was a move in working class movement there was an enthusiasm in working class movement and Bhutto Zulfikar Bhutto gave a free hand to uh, to the people to the workers to form form uh, their trade unions they gave, gave a right to the working class to form a trade union uh, at that time there is a uh, great links with uh, the, the workers movement and intellectual they are they have uh, some group discussions at that time and they and they supported uh, the very well supported the struggle uh, in a strike in Karachi and after that during the period of Ziaul Haq there was a great mass movement uh, in 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 the uh, in the main city of Punjab in Lahore against the Sharia laws and I remember that we participated more than thousand uh, from my uh, trade union and organization women uh, organization uh, thousand people they participated and whole the mall road was blocked at that time against the dictator mm. dictator was ruling at that time at that time there is no left political party because of the long period of dictatorship they they snub uh, the the the, uh, the few figure of socialist uh, ideological people they went underground and uh, there is no link with that uh, political peoples like Tariq Ali is sitting he claimed that he is a socialist uh, and I really respect him he is sitting in UK somebody is sitting in Canada and somebody is sitting in somewhere else and they said that there is a socialist movement is going on in Pakistan no never never and why we are thinking that uh, we think that there is a no real genuine political party of working class we are uh, a worker we definitely we, we need to have a debate inside the organization and inside the trade union movement or uh, what what type of political party we want uh, whether we want a socialism uh, we we follow the Marxist uh, philosophy or what we think because we are the simple people we want a party of worker party to who uplift the workers demand and the, the people of that party uh, the representative of working class sitting in the parliament and who make the decisions about uh, the future of the the people rather than the feudal lords and feudal women uh, they have their own mindset they are sitting in the parliament and only gossiping and uh, doing nothing <laughs> <laughs>
thank you both. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, open it up to questions from the floor. Um, we have a microphone here. I don't know if we want to, yeah, leave it. Yeah, okay, great. So if, if you could just come up to the microphone, we'll take one at a time. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for having this panel. Um, my question, which kind of deals with... Um, please, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Chase Mechanic. Um, I'm an undergraduate here. Mm -hmm. um, my question, which sort of deals with questions already raised, was even if, like, by some miracle, a genuinely leftist pro-Labor Party were able to capture the Pakistani government, uh, how would that bring peace in, in Pakistan's war zone? Because it seems to me that the Taliban is holding these areas hostage and it's not going to give them up through you know negotiations peaceably so what you know what alternatives are there even if the Pakistani government were to reform you know, what alternatives are there to violent conflict uh uh, actually, uh, very recently, I'm going to respond to your question because, but I would like to share with you that recently uh, in Islamabad city, which is a capital of Pakistan, uh, 250 houses, uh, 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 the U.S. Uh, people they buy a 250 houses uh, on on rent. Uh, and uh, there is a great rumor, uh, and it's it's uh, people have an argument why the, the Black Eagle are existing in Pakistan. There is a U.S. military base in Afghanistan, in, in Pakistan. Uh, army generals very frequently they are visiting Pakistan. One day they took a plane and then have a meeting with the president and with the interior minister and with the prime minister and then come back and they give the guideline to attack like this. Osama bin Laden is there, the bin Laden is there and bin Laden is Nobody knows whether they are the Taliban's or who they are. Uh, they are, yes, there is an Islamic extremist, so-called Islamic extremism uh, is there. The, the people who are fighting uh, mostly denying all their basic rights. You know, in Wana and Waziristan, since years, years ago, there was no development work uh, there. The peoples have uh, nothing to eat. In these days, yes, there is a uh, war going on, but rather than to happy uh, the, uh, the Obama government and the Bush government, it is a responsibility of our rulers to make a policies according to our own interest. Now our sovereignty is already threatened. There is a war uh, going on and uh, drone attacks are going on to maintain a peace and to um, build a progressive society. I think it is important because there is uh, thousands of madrasas in, in Pakistan which is operating in which uh, thousands of children are getting education according to their own uh, ideology, not uh, related with, uh, with Quran or any anybody. They are giving, uh, preaching those kids. Uh, what alternative we give those poor people? These kids are uh, educating, uh, getting education free, free books, uniforms, clothes, and 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 the food. They are so. The 80 percent people who are uh, 53 percent people living under below the poverty line, they are sending their children to get education because it's a free education. They are giving the food, so there is uh, no system to check and balance those madarsas. You know the these madarsas played a great role to change the mindset of the youth in Pakistan. And during the Ziaul Haq period, the Ziaul Haq, because of the Afghanistan war, uh, there was a war uh, with Russia, and uh, so the intelligence agency, ISI and CIA, they supported Afghan, uh, Taliban and Afghan Jihad very well. And there is a great unemployment in, in provinces like NWFP, Northern West Frontier Post and uh, Balochistan. And these jihadis people, they contact, they uh, uh, take a one boy from one family. They said, okay, we will giving you uh, the bunny 
to monthly salary and he is going to the jihad so you know the madrasa is working very in a proper way and no government can have a system to check and balance these madrasa so what alternative we are giving to the to our kids whether we uh, are able to establish any education system uh, to uh, for free education for these people to uh, how to build a pakistan and how to maintain a peace whether there is a great campaigns are going on in pakistan uh, to mobilize uh, we are able to mobilize people to protest against the government policies to stop war so i think these things these areas we are thinking to what alternative we are giving to why we are uh, there is a extremist groups are there in pakistan but we never in during the election we uh, only one or three seats they 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 win only one or two or three seats pakistani people never never elect the islamic so called islamic extremist political parties even though they are very well organized like jamaat islami is very well organized and who build these sectarian and uh, fundamentalist group the dictators supported by the cia supported by the us uh, government sorry i am sorry to say again and again but uh, i think there is a great need to organize uh, uh, inside the pakistan to organize a uh, uh, youth a discussion with youth uh how to maintain a peace and how to uh, make a society free from all kind of uh, discrimination uh to build a progressive society uh, with youth and with young peoples and yes of course with uh, intellectuals and uh, uh, there is a, a great need to be a, a alliance uh, with uh, trade union movement with professional organizations like lawyers movement like uh, doctors and and intellectuals and and they can uh, they can struggle uh, collectively then it it will possible to maintain a peace and uh, build a good society and better society where there is no exploitation at the end you want to yeah. something else. and to choose the right people in in election because right now uh, it is a gift of the dictatorship uh, uh, regime that uh, the common people cannot run the election because he or she have no money to hmm. well um i think rubina i will take issue with what you just said about um not you know about the fact that the islamists in in pakistan in any election uh, never won any seats but that actually is it, it seems to me it is not really an adequate answer uh because the fact that islamism and th- the taliban is such a yes. important problem that they don't they don't have the need to be in the parliament they control the parliament and they control the i mean the pakistani military is part of the taliban mm. has been so intimately involved in the production of the taliban mm. uh, the pakistani military has been supporting as you described yes, the yes. madrasas yeah. in punjab uh, and so the taliban the the force of the taliban already is very i mean it's they are entrenched in the country and uh, the fact that they could so easily take over the valley of sawat which means that the sovereignty of pakistan actually pakistan lost its sovereignty a long time ago yeah and the it's really kind of astonishing and sort of you know one wonders why there is so much noise around this issue without really thinking that um the emergence of the taliban which goes historically back in time and now they have come into their own and they're ready to you know take over and so it's irrelevant for them whether they are in the pakistani government or not they they are there no. yeah i'm agree sorry i'm agree with you that uh, the talibans are there but why they are there 
because uh, US started war in Afghanistan and before the Afghanistan war when the Ziaulak mm -hmm. was there he uh, there was a war in Afghanistan and then they migrated and you know there was at that time there was no system to check uh, to register those uh, those people who came to Pakistan so yes of course uh, it, it, there is a, a problem uh, since years years ago not right now but uh, in, there is a ISI connection with the Taliban uh, right now, I don't know, uh, maybe not like uh, during Zawlaq or Musharraf period, it's, it's less than. But uh, the problem is this, that we are getting the money from the international agencies and now they are, our Pakistani army got a billions and billions of dollars during the Musharraf period to support the Pakistan army to, uh, uh, to resist against uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalists, so-called uh, Taliban and Islamic fundamentalist and now they are demanding to increase the attack to increase the attack to uh, rather than to think about the reaction of the attack now the Taliban's are not only sitting in Wana and Waziristan they spread all over the country so that's why the attacks are uh, suicide attacks are taking place every day more than uh, five or six Okay, but um, if I could just kind of come back to, to Chase's question, yeah. I mean, to, to what extent can we really imagine the scenario that, that Chase invokes? I mean, mm -hmm. um, isn't really what we're talking about that the, the military struggle against the Taliban is profoundly political? Mm -hmm. so that it is inconceivable that mm -hmm. the left could really gain strength mm -hmm. in Pakistan without it gaining strength elsewhere. The issue I mean, cannot isn't, be isn't the Taliban really a fundamentally political rather than a military mm -hmm. question? Oh, they are still in the, in the, in, the, and they have a good connection with the, the, the with the, uh, interna uh, the, the intelligence agency in Pakistan and there are so many agencies are intelligence agencies international agencies are working in Pakistan but now the situation can only change if the street the people power can uh, 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 they protest against this uh, army operation and they protest against this uh, the policies of uh, the government which is adopting uh, in 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 Pakistan I think only the people's masses can uh, change this uh, mm. through maybe through revolution or maybe I don't know about I mean, could I could I just ask a follow-up would sure. that be all right <clears throat> I mean what I mean, the point about how the Islamist parties control so few seats in parliament but still are able to hold so much power just shows that they're holding this power by force, not because they represent the legitimate aspirations of the people they rule over. So if hypothetically, you know, a, a government were to turn leftist and try to promulgate, you know, alternative education to the madrasas and, you know, pro-labor laws and, and all yes. of these things that you mentioned, how, how would they be able to promulgate it when you know the Taliban in Waziristan considers itself like an independent emirate and won't allow the government to assert those kinds of policies in that region. I mean, just mm -hmm. how could that how could that work other than than violently displacing the Taliban? And we already got a taste of that, you know, when we tried to or when the military tried to pick off a few thousand Taliban in the Swat Valley and created hundreds of thousand refugees. But is there is there any alternative? to that? How could, they, how could they affect those policies without militarily taking out the Taliban in those regions? Mm. The answer well, yeah. Uh, I think what Spencer pointed out uh, is correct, that the issue really is political. Mm. And political. Uh, as I mentioned in my report, that it is the collapse of that politics. It is the collapse of leftist politics with all of its limitations, but at least it was uh, aspiring 
for liberal democracy or and the rights of uh, workers, uh, the rights of labor unions, uh, also for you know greater participation of the left uh, in the government. I mean, with all of their limitations, there was still something to be said about it. And the the fact that for whatever a short period of time, when the labor movement and the student movement and the leftist movement, when they all came to a head in 1968-69, they were able to uh, overthrow the dictatorship of Ayub Khan. Uh, and so the, today, the fact that there isn't any such politics, that's the problem. And that void has been filled by the politics of the Taliban, which is very conservative, which is, um, I mean, they have a very archaic sense of government, which is, as Rubina pointed out, is based on Sharia. Uh, so, so even, you're right, even if there is a leftist government, uh, first of all, it's hard to imagine that there can be sure. such a thing. Uh, but I think the, the real issue or the real question is that who can root this problem out? Uh, and does the Pakistani military have the will to do that? And I think that is questionable at the moment. I mean, I mean wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't it be fair to say that the that the army operations in SWAT um, really indicate? I mean, exemplify um, the contempt of the Pakistani military for the people of Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that um, they really, the, the Pakistani military is the most direct occupying power mm -hmm. <laughs> of yeah. Pakistan yes. uh, in the sense that they shelled their own population. I mean, it's right. you, one can't divorce the question of the nature of these military operations mm -hmm. from the class character of the government that engages in them. Um, you know, that's I think the the issue here is that it would be inconceivable. The the, the entire circumstance of, of SWAT would be inconceivable uh, if the government of Pakistan was not deeply ambivalent about its uh, opposition to the Taliban mm -hmm. and was not deeply ambivalent about the rights of the citizens of the people of SWAT mm -hmm. that were betrayed by the Taliban occupation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, that that's sort of the kind of problem with the, 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 the premises of the question have, have come up against this problem, which is that the army, the army's operations are, can't be understood as merely instrumental, but really do exemplify a political character, even in their military aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have another question. Yeah, Craig. If we grant that the Taliban represents a political movement responding to the needs of uh, of a populace in uh, Afghanistan and, and, and Pakistan, uh, the poorest of the poor oppressed uh, by feudal like land conditions, then it seems as though the possibility of just a popular movement responding to another popular movement that has already taken hold seems like uh, an unlikely proposition for success. But if popular movements through court uh, won't be sufficient in and of themselves, what kind of politics would be more adequate to pose a political challenge to the integrity of, of the Taliban regime uh, to push uh, progressive politics in the, in the region further? Would such politics take a national approach? Mm -hmm. Would they be international? And if so, what would such an international movement look like? I don't know which one of you want to start with that. You can, I, okay. Uh, yeah. You can, and then I include my. Okay. Um, no, I think I think that that is a that's a very good question. Um, at the moment, well, I think it's not really a national problem in Pakistan. The Taliban is an international problem, and therefore, the solution or the war against the Taliban is an international war. And at the moment, it it appears to be a very difficult issue because uh, we really don't have any form of 
real leftist internationalism that can address this issue. I mean, I can again speak to um, the la last night's event and also uh, with respect to the anti-war movement and sort of lawyers movement that emerged in, in Pakistan for the restoration of the judiciary, um, the powers of the judiciary and sp uh, specifically the reinstatement of Chief Justice. Uh, but that movement actually had its own, had very severe limitations just like the anti-war movement has its limitations, which is to say that these movements and, and protest movements and demonstrations actually don't think through the consequences of, you know, for instance, American withdrawal from Pakistan, uh, and how would how would uh, it, the, that, that would pose the issue of the Taliban then, or they don't really. I think it seems to me these movements never really thought through what would be the consequences uh, if the Taliban were to take over. I mean, I, it's uh, there's a very it's very astonishing that how that issue is completely neglected and ignored in uh, the discourse of these movements. So it seems to me that the answer to the problem of the Taliban. Uh, these movements or the sort of, uh, you know, just this emphasis on some kind of solidarity of laborers, workers, I think there are very serious limitations uh, within these movements to actually think through the problem. And it is because they are not really taking seriously the issue of the failure of the left internationally, and it is the outcome of that that we are kind of facing today. So I think that's how I would. And I think uh, uh, according to my views uh, and my uh, federation views, the war is not a solution to, to end the Taliban uh, from, uh, to push Taliban in somewhere else and throne Taliban somewhere else. Let's start negotiations. War is not a solution to uh, to uh, uh, to send more army troops in uh, uh, the U.S.-led uh, army troops in Afghanistan. Let's start negotiations with the people who are uh, who are sitting there. You can find some uh, progressive, uh, maybe some the people start negotiation, start some development work there. Uh, because it is not an easy task for any ruling government to uh, to uh, to uh, restrict Taliban's on some areas. We don't know. Uh, I personally don't know whether they are Taliban. They have a uh, connection with Al Qaeda because there is a difference between the Taliban. Al Qaeda is a is an organization who spread all over the world, and Taliban's are they are fighting there. They they got the support previously from U.S. and from Saudi Arabia and from other Middle East countries. So I think the the way to tackle this, if uh, without national socialist movement how can we build an international uh, socialist uh, strong uh, movement so i think it is a time for the political parties also to uh, to regroup and to re rethink about what what they are doing uh, what uh, what political uh, uh, gains they are they are losing uh, their their votes in in Pakistan, and uh, it is really very uh, difficult for them to to get only U.S. support and they can win the election. It's really very difficult. So I think uh, let's uh, think about that and move forward. Uh, organize uh, some uh, group discussions with youth and with political groups and with workers uh, movement and with uh, women uh, groups to uh, what what they think about that. And did we have any alternative to establish a school education system for poor people, to open a, a, a center for uh, women workers uh, where they got some consciousness and some awareness about their rights and uh, uh, to move forward to uh, build a new Pakistan without Taliban and uh, whether we have any connection with the people in Sawat. Uh, the girls who want, the women who want to go to the college and school in Sabat, uh, how it, it is possible to find the ways to do something. 
and it's need uh, definitely atiya is right to some international support also but can i just uh, ask you kind of press on this question rabina of the of negotiating i mean isn't it the case that there are that when we speak of the talk negotiation uh, dialogue maybe i i but i mean it it does seem that there are when we say taliban we're talking about people <laughs> who are armed and willing to kill in order to advance the political agenda of enslaving the women of mm-hmm. Afghanistan and Pakistan and enforcing a regime of sharia law mm-hmm. like we saw in Afghanistan in the 1990s mm-hmm. and that they are irreconcilable mm-hmm. um and that it's this that we see in the in the spread through Waziristan and and Swat where they they don't consult mm. the wishes of the of, of people there they're very well organized they're they're militarily trained in a way that those who might oppose them simply are not so isn't there a a, a question of who will oppose this very well organized force uh, actually uh, in my according to my uh, views i think that uh, in the politics there is no way to uh, to attack on others but uh, you are right that uh, it is the right way to uh, negotiate or dialogue to give and take we are in the situation to give something and they give something to us but uh, it's better to uh, to rebuild and uh, the political parties they re- they rethink about uh, they uh, uh, invite the peoples uh, because if uh, they are not uh, talking with with the peoples about their policies the policies are not open uh, the, the common people they don't know about what policies they are adopting in a specific that areas where the taliban are there in balochistan they are not a talibani peoples but they are fighting because they denied since more than 20 30 years ago they denied their basic rights hmm. and every government they put some budget uh, uh, they now this government is is uh, they introduce a one package for balochi peoples and uh, under this pr- package they give a billions of uh, money to uh, that state why the peoples want the independent state in pakistan because they denied their b- basic rights so i think it's a, it's a difficult uh, uh, thing to uh, uh, war is not a solution for me being a, a activist of uh, human right if uh, it it's really it's rather than to uh, to attack and to because when we the army operation is uh, uh, they are attacking more 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 then the result is we you can show every day you are showing every day the the suicide attack and uh, it's go, it's still going on you know the fbi intelligence agencies the police and the army are standing like this and they are killing those people who but, they are nobody knows but whether they are taliban or who they are but do you think you know the hatred is increasing rather than to decrease the hatred so we definitely adopt some some policies to decrease the hatred to do at least to do to stop these madrasas now they are strictly checking the madrasas also and this <clears throat> interior ministry announced that before that there is a, a foreigner some muslim country foreign uh, mullah is in the uh, mosque but now they restrict it now they said no foreign mullah no head of the mosque uh, is uh, should belongs to uh, any uh, any muslim uh, international community so they are taking some measures but i don't know whether they because our intelligence agencies are very much indulge in uh, to support that uh, uh, jihadis in in past should we have some more questions we take our responsibility being a trade union and being a human right activist and the government take their responsibility and the political party sitting in the opposition they think about that how to uh, rather than to say yes yes it's okay it's okay to uh, say that this policy is right and this is right so i think it's better to work together collectively to 
I mean, I, I guess the reason why, I mean, I guess the reason why I would use the word fascist. Yeah. Uh, with reference to the Taliban, yeah, is to signal this irreconcilable character. Mm -hmm. um, you know that it's not it it it's it's the fascism that's introducing war. Mm -hmm. Now I know that you'll say that American imperialism is also complicit in the rise of that fascism. Yes, of course, there but is it, a fascism. It does there. seem to me that um, you know we can imagine the United States. Uh, I mean, in, today, the amount of foreign direct investment in Pakistan is very low. Uh, the, the number, you know, the kind of immediate stakes of imperialism in the region are very low. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can, and we see the Obama administration washing its hands, mm -hmm. right, and saying, you know, just let Afghanistan go. Mm. Right. Let's not bother anymore. Let's have no more soldiers. Let's not have the the, the pay the price for this military uh, adventure. And it seems to me that the war will be there when the Americans go, because the war comes from the Taliban. Right. And in that sense, I think when you were saying, I mean, negotiating with the Taliban or making peace with the Taliban is not necessarily going to solve the problems of Pakistan. Uh, so, yes, one can, you know, disagree. Uh, one can... But what solution you people have? If you say that uh, if the U.S. Army is... Uh, uh, if there is no war, uh, if, uh, do you think... What, what do you think about? What is the solution? The war is the solution? No, but it may be that to understand the situation. The U.S. Is to uh, led war, no uh, led army is the solution. They spent eight years in Afghanistan and what they gain. But then the, it seems to me that the solution you are proposing is also not a very viable solution, which is making peace with the Taliban, and that is going to take the country further backward and is going to be very severely detrimental for Pakistani society, for its people, for the women. So it seems to me that that is also not the solution. So I'm, I'm talking you, because I think that war is not a solution. Well, I think. I mean, I, I guess I would say that I completely. To take some measure to uh, to move forward, rather than to think about that, uh, rather than to do something uh, to uh, to take some measures to move forward to how to rebuild our society. Mm -hmm. There is no uh, violence, and where there is no uh, discrimination, and. Right. I, I guess I would I would say that it we it may be the case that there's no immediate solution yeah. given the forces uh, in play and I that might be part of understanding the situation is to say that you know give, you know we don't have a government or in you know yes. we have a situation in which there are people who are armed and militarily yes. determined mm -hmm. and there's no obvious opposition to them because we know that the Americans and the Pakistani army mm -hmm. will never oppose mm -hmm. the right wing forces of Pakistan yeah, they're just altogether complicit with them on. right but anyway we have a, another question um, I, know, I was just going to ask a question because we're talking so much about these right wing groups um, you know what um, where are the sort of places where the unions can really form strong relationships and how is that working internationally um, you, you were saying before too about like learning certain trade union skills um, from American trade unionists. Um, I know there's a great need even for people to report in Pakistan on the things that trade unions do, because obviously people really don't know at all what trade unions do here, um, in America or in Pakistan in some sense. Um, and also, I mean, you know, there's no, not really, there's this sort of a vexing question for a long time, there's not really like global unions. Unions are almost exclusively based in certain national frameworks. And so bringing them together has a kind of strange quality. There's also there's obviously the idea of having mass unions that go across an industry, like oil workers of many countries coming together. But how can one think about sort of articulating a kind of politics of bringing together unions from different countries to do 
either a mass action, a, a drive for organizing, something against militarism. I mean, where is there a good place and how is there an attempt to make that possible? Um, I mean, I'm just curious, like, is there a call, you were saying yesterday, there's a need for your union to have a paper. I mean, obviously that would be wonderful um, so that the kind of education that's not happening in Pakistan would go on. Um, I'm just wondering, what are the possibilities that you're hoping for in the near future? I think your question is really very important and it is a, a need of the time to build a solidarity among the working class internationally and how to support the struggle of uh, the workers uh, going on all over the all over the world. So I think that uh, um, to build an international uh, solidarity and to support uh, which we uh, need and maybe the US workers need it's uh, to know about each other what 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 the, maybe the problems are same the strategy what they are using to uh, to uh, to to aware their masses and what strategy they are using to to uh, overcome the problems which they are facing in the united states and in pakistan and uh, what, uh, because you have industry-wise uh, unions, but we don't have industry-wise union. We have plant-to-plant -plant level a union there. And uh, it, uh, at least to exchange uh, communication and share information with each other and to organize the exchange visits and uh, any internship program for uh, for the youth, especially uh, working in, 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 in the factories or uh, for youth, a, a, a trade Trade union cadre, uh, uh, young trade union cadre. It's uh, consisting on women, on on uh, youth to exchange, uh, exchange uh, a cross border exchange and, and a training programs for them, and uh, get uh, to support uh, the uh, the struggle which is going on. It's suppose there is any factory in in Pakistan which the management has already decided to close the cycle factory, uh, even though the cycles. Uh, uh, is is they are getting the profit because the people are not afford to buy a car they are buying a cycle especially the working class which is in the majority the poor people so but he decide because he don't want trade union in his in, in his uh, factory so i think the, that kind of uh, solidarity to strengthen the trade union movement and and uh, the information about the trade union movement the past uh, 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 his History of the trade union movement in U.S. and 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 in Pakistan is also and some political education, which I think it's really very important for uh, for the working class of uh, Pakistan to to move forward to specific. Can land. I actually also um, just ask you something? Uh, it seems to me, I mean, probably, and that's where I can my question comes. In do you think that uh, trade unions in Pakistan now fall within the bracket? of NGOs. No, no, not not all. Not all. Because it seems to me uh, that with the collapse of the 70s labor movement mm -hmm. and complete lack of industrialization yeah. and the transformation of Pakistan's economy, uh, which is so, which is largely based on remittances mm -hmm. that come from the Middle East, uh, in that situation, uh, I I think, I mean, and that's where I'm curious, that the character of the unions itself changes, and so I think that they're somehow close to the model of NGOs where you know they are they function as some kind of pressure groups non-governmental pressure groups but it's not really clear how the workers or you know they're being organized like it's what I'm asking is that the nature of organization itself has changed um, with the transformation of Pakistan's economy and with the collapse of the labor movements of the 70s actually uh, when I uh, uh, went to the India more than uh, several times uh, there was a trade un strong trade union movement which is affiliated with any uh, CPP and CPIM and CPIL. Uh, they are, uh, these trade union federations are very well supported by international labor organization. They are supporting and strengthen the Indian trade unions movement through different projects. 
and uh, if there is any strike there was there was a mass mobilization uh, campaign going on in india and mass strike uh, joined by the hundred thousands of uh, workers india is a big country but in pakistan because the trade union is declining same like india but uh, is uh, the trade union membership is declining day by day if any uh, international organization who can support to uh, to uh, uh, to build some uh, skill uh, programs and to uh, organize some training programs for trade union carer or for youth i think uh, it's it's uh, you are right that it's changed they are working uh, they are getting support not they are not only relying mostly uh, a few are relying on their membership subscription so that's why it is really very difficult for trade union movement uh, to uh, if the uh, mostly that uh, the uh, the companies they lay off they terminate the workers and it is very difficult for trade union uh, for any trade union to run a cases uh, of these uh, workers in, in in different courts because the legal system is is very really very lengthy so how can you uh, mobilize those workers terminated workers since one year two year or three years so i think the working class need some uh, uh, not uh, only financial assistance but uh, physical uh, moral uh, moral uh, support also and the support to like print their uh, publication and some uh, brochures like like uh, posters they need some uh, little support because they can they can uh, like my organization is not depending on any any uh, donation from outside so if somebody gives it's okay but we activity to activity we are generating our our funds uh, if there is a an, any activity for we need 30000 or 40000 we generate we are not on relying on any donor uh, and we are not accepting uh, happy to give any pr proposal to any donors who uh, restrict our activities to to make a guidelines you do this and you do that So uh, of course there is a change in I mean I guess there was something that I was amazed by when I was reading about the Iraqi unions and th about the Iraqi unions yeah um that you know US labor against the war it helped them print like newspapers and it done all sorts of things but then the American labor movement doesn't have a newspaper it's like there's a strange uh, you know <laughs> we could learn from different sides but uh I I'm just curious if there's um is there a push to do for the unions to do some kind of mass education work and would they try to cooperate with um unions in other countries it's something you know that usually left parties had done in the past yeah, was mass yeah. education basically yeah. um and we're engaged in some very modest mass education here <laughs> um but i'm just curious what that what the prospects of that is mm -hmm. what's in Uh I was going to ask why it is that even given the history of about 63 years in Pakistan during which trade unions were heavily repressed that you still have a vibrant trade union movement that's focused not just on immediate economic goals but on broader social and political ones mm. while even in America which has a much more favorable environment for trade unions you have a much more modest set of goals because uh, there there is there was no dictatorship in america and uh, pakistan formed since 63 years ago and 33 years there was a martial law and you know the dictatorship the dictators they snub the people's right and they uh, snub all the political institutions and thousands and thousands of people they lost their job during the that that time and uh, they don't want uh, trade union in, in in any they don't want any political activity which uh, uh, it's uh, related with the trade unions movement or any factory or any political uh, party so that is the reason now right now there is a anarchy in pakistan there is no political party who claim that they are doing a good work and they are mobilizing the masses 
so that is the reason our trade union is is going week week day by day but still they are existing there still they are resisting still in within in these uh, difficult situation we are resisting and we are fighting uh, against the bosses uh, with the bosses and uh, with the state and during the dictatorship period our trade union members and our leadership they uh, they behind the bar several times they receive a life threat uh, they receive a threatened letters several times and still it's going on and that's why i i i emphasize uh, um, when it, there was a discussion in pakistan i said that jointly it it's it is a responsibility of the trade union movement to uh, to involve a small shopkeeper also to be a member of the trade union to uh, 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 the lady health worker to be a member of a trade union to encourage women workers to be a member of a trade union to give a space to the women worker to be a, so that's need a lot of work to work hard rather than to sit in the union office and I think uh, um, there's a little irony in the history of Pakistan and the history of the labor movements in Pakistan. It is very interesting to note that when uh, the labor movement was at its peak, uh, which is the late 60s, it was under the dictatorship of General Ayub Khan. And since the movement, and it is because the politics of the movement was informed by leftist ideals of the time, that they not only forced him to resign, but they also then forced the interim government that was headed by Yahya Khan, that, and they had, there, there is sufficient documentation in the history of labor, the labor archives in Pakistan, that they sat him down for weeks five to six weeks and they did not budge until they were they succeeded in exacting their demands and the demands were to unionize the right to strike the right to collective bargain uh, which are the you know sort of the hallmarks of any union struggle so they were able to do that and it is only when the labor movement itself actually kind of um, retreated in the early 70s and uh, get, got behind the People's Party of Pakistan and was betrayed by the People's Party of Pakistan, but still the, what the labor movement was doing, the workers were doing, they were, were fully aware of what they were doing and what they were getting into. So, so you know, again, I think the issue really is how workers organize their politics. And when it was organized on the basis of a progressive reform program, mm. they were able to advance their movement. Yeah, right. And when that project was abdicated or was when they withdrew from that project, that's when they also kind of contributed uh, in their own defeat. Mm -hmm. You're right. Tana? I, uh, I have a, a question about, um, I was reading an article recently in which it talked about popular music in Pakistan and how a lot of um, bands had been incorporating um, the drone attacks into their, to their songs and that there's a really like, uh, a lot of people have been organizing around this like anti drone attack line and also they would uh, show videos of the drone attacks but uh, the article didn't mention anything about whether youth or bands had been addressing the idea of like of anti-Taliban sentiment and I was just wondering like in popular culture in Pakistan how often that gets expressed. I guess this is more for you, Rubina. Pakistani rock bands pro Taliban Pakistani anti Taliban popular culture mein, music art usme unki kya approach hai, uh, Taliban ke 
Uh, I think we have, uh, uh, it's uh, only uh, uh, propaganda that Pakistan is, uh, is uh, there is a Taliban, uh, uh, there is a pro-Taliban, a few uh, like I have an example of Junaid Jamshid, who is a pop singer, and uh, he now he's not a no more singer. He th he think that he he want to be a, a very close to the religion, and maybe he joins some uh, sectarian group or something. The people have a right to sing whatever song they want, whatever, uh, in, especially in this uh, uh, government, when the People Party government took a power every time, there was uh, some changes you can see on television, you can saw at television also, there was no dubatta cover they had uh, on the television and on the screen, and when there was a dictatorship government, then said, very recently you can it, it's a policy of the pakistani television corporation at that time to cover their hats and not allow in any drama so uh, there is i i saw a television drama uh, against this uh, the war and against the i saw a movie i don't know whether you saw khuda ke liye which uh, produced by the geo television which is a i think it's a good movie and uh, people People have a right to dance. People have oh, a right I, I to. Think that I, I made there is no Taliban element, pro-Taliban element in in the pop singing or in any uh, band uh, working, uh, playing, uh, uh, running a group in in Pakistan. I I never seen. No, no. My question is that there's. A couple of groups yeah. that are very like um, they consider themselves to be like radical rock bands, and uh, I don't know, akin to Rage Against the Machine, and they're very like uh, they use the imagery of drone attacks, and they consider themselves to be political rock bands. Mm -hmm. But I had never read an article where like there are bands that also have like a not a I'm not saying that our bands pro Taliban I'm saying are there okay. people with that sort of political message and is that a popular sentiment in yeah the there youth? was a, a, a re, very recently uh, a one band lal band it was formed by you know the Temur mm -hmm. <laughs> Temur uh, Temur Rahman and another they are uh, they are organizing uh, they are playing their band in in within inside the community in in Pakistan whether I I don't know whether I uh, I cover your question or not, but uh, uh, they are doing uh, their best. I think uh, we have a song uh, related with the liberation movement and uh, uh, not against the Taliban, uh, but not in the favor of the Taliban. Uh, the musical groups are working. If I'm unable to respond to your question because it is out of my, uh, yeah. uh, I I never. Uh, here the the bands I don't okay. like. The. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I like uh, I like Indian light music, classical. Um, well, we we got a question behind you, Gabe. Okay. Um, well, okay. let's have let's have the last these be the last two questions. Oh, okay, good. Mine's just a short. I'm Gabriel uh, Gaster, former undergraduate, and mine's a short question for Rubina. Um, what kinds of industries are in your labor federation uh, and um, um, well, that's the first question. And then the second question is, um, is your union overtly trying to um, set up negotiations with the Taliban, or how do you situate yourselves with the Taliban? Uh, what are the what are the union's polit your union's politics with respect to the Taliban? If you're not overtly anti the Taliban, then what is your stance, and what are the stance of the workers and, and in your union, and, and how do you guys see the prospect of further Talibanization of Pakistan? Uh, and the effect actually, that that would have on the workers. Uh, yeah, yeah, good question. Actually, the, there is a different uh, type of industry in Pakistan. Uh, we have uh, uh, steel industry and uh, food and pharmaceutical and garment and and uh, electronic industry existing in Pakistan. And in relation with the. the um, 
سیکنڈ پارٹ کیا تھا ابھی جب بھولی گئی دماغ سے انگلش کی وجہ سے کہ آپ کی آپ کی آرگنائزیشن جو ہے وہ کس طرح سے ان کو طالبان کو دیکھتی ہیں ایکچولی یو نو دیٹ ان دا یونین ان دا مومنٹ وی ہیو ڈفرینٹ پیپل آئیڈیالوجیکل پیپل سم آر ویری ریلیجیس سم آر سیمی ریلیجیس سم آر نان ریلیجیس سم بلانگس ٹو ہندو اینڈ ویری فیو کرسچن کمیونٹیز آلسو a member of uh, trade union federation and uh, we never discuss about uh, 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 very uh, closely about uh, uh, about discussion on, on any religion but because of uh, the war and the tension which is going on and before that uh, we discuss a lot that the, the purpose of the trade union is to serve the people and to serve the workers whether he or she belongs to any any uh, religious any any uh, any uh, religion uh, whether it is christian or whether it is muslim and in relation to taliban yes of course we we, we discuss that uh, the, the things which is going on in pakistan is is uh, totally uh, we the working class is never accept uh, never uh, think that it is good that taliban are uh, are uh, sitting in in waziristan and and doing this and doing that they are against the majority of the working class is is against the talibanization in in pakistan and as well as in afghanistan and they are against the drone uh, drone attack they have a great hatred against the the uh, the people uh, who are involving in this war like pakistan army the isi and the international intelligence agencies and we are discussing that how can we play a positive role to uh, to uh, overcome this situation and what activities we are going to organize we are organizing every week we have a meeting in different district of uh, 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 in every city of uh, different towns in every city four or five or six towns so we are discussing about the situation but we never discuss that we want taliban in our country and uh, we want mullahism and we want this uh, so i think we uh, the the if there is a, a democracy then it suit everybody if there is a democratic government if there is a progressive and liberal government uh, we can uh, get uh, our uh, demands uh, easily and we can struggle easily if there is a uh, extremist organization it is really very difficult for for us to uh, to do some but we are trying our best because the situation is is uh, really very worst, worst and it is a time to work more uh, hard hard and to um. This young lady will be our last question. Okay. Hi, Catherine Randall, Columbia College. Um, my question is, what are some of the things you think um, will work to foster and move toward equality of women in Pakistan, and um, in what ways would you say that um, sh Sharia law and um, the Taliban are um, hindering this? <clears throat> actually shariat laws are uh, not uh, uh, it's it's since years ago 1982 it was uh, formulated by the dictator zaul haq and at that time there was a massive uh, massive demonstration and rallies all over the pakistan against that shariat laws and uh, that is the reason uh, that uh, unfortunately we are we are uh, not uh, getting get got a full success to abolish that discriminatory laws because of the uh, weaknesses of uh, women organization who are unable to involve some uh, uh, trade union and other uh, political uh, groups to uh, struggle together to abolish these uh, kind of uh, in relation to gender disc discrimination to end gender discrimination i think we need Uh, uh, policies uh, to where the uh, to uh, to pressurize the government to formulate a policies which is uh, uh, to end gender discrimination from every sphere of life and to uh, 
to uh, boost up the morale of uh, women and uh, to involve women in uh, in uh, decision making bodies in different decision decision making bodies uh, unfortunately uh, the pakistani government uh, ratify some convention for the elimination against women sida convention but these convention are not implemented so it is a responsibility of the uh, uh, it is our weaknesses that we are unable so to aware uh, the male uh, counterparts and uh, the male leadership of the trade unions and the political parties about the gender discrimination to end gender discrimination and what is the gender uh, what is the the gender and why uh, the human being the human being is same but why the women's right are are uh, are violating in in our country so i think it's that kind of debate is really helpful to and uh, because of the struggle of the women's movement now we are gaining that uh, there is a law of against sexual harassment against women there is a big, big punishment if somebody harass uh, a girl at workplace but uh, it is a time the law is there but the, the the women don't know about whether there is a law and how can she go to the court and how can so now it is our duty to to uh, to uh, aware these women and to help these women to go this in uh, to find out a lawyer and to go that court because women are socially very much suppressed by the, their family members they said oh you are going to the the to the court which is wrong uh, people are uh, saying that your uh, your daughter is uh, going to the court against their employer or against their manager or against their male colleague so i think it is it is uh, we are doing our best to uh, to uh, giving uh, to uh, involve uh, male people peoples and uh, to, we are sitting in a different ministry like national plan of action committee we are a part of a national plan of uh, action committee which is related with the cedar convention and we are a part of ilo convention uh, a body a tripartite body which uh, existing in pakistan which is discussing about the ilo convention and the issues related with the workers and the it is uh, we are doing our best to uh, to gender sensitize the trade unions also because they have still a patriarchal ideology so we are few but we are moving forward so uh, i think uh, i don't know whether i cover your question or not it is difficult because the maybe have a feudalistic society there Ravina it's been a real privilege to have you on the panel Atya I want to thank you as well and ask You're everyone welcome, to uh, to join me thank you